what I'm going to talk about today mainly is just lots of stories from my career, uh, lots of stories, good stories, bad stories. This is mainly a therapy session for me, so thank you for coming. And uh, any help you can give me afterwards, I'd really appreciate it. So, first story, Odd Man Out. I started at one organisation, um, and within a few days, it was really clear to me that everybody there was into cycling. So, a good thing, right? Everyone's into cycling, they're all into their fitness, they're all into talking about all the different clothes you can wear for cycling, apparently there's lots. And also all of the uh, different things you can do to your bike, apparently. Um, I wasn't into cycling, but I was into roller derby, and that's got wheels, so apparently that's okay. And um, there was one other guy there who wasn't into cycling. And he was a developer on one of my teams. And um, he, nobody liked him. Nobody liked working with him. Nobody made any pretense to want to work with him in any way at all. He knew it, they knew it. And they didn't like him because he was slower on the uptake than quite a lot of the developers. It took him longer to get his mind around something. He also asked lots of stupid basic questions whenever they were talking about something. And in the end, they had to stop him asking them and, and shut him down. But one of the other reasons they didn't like him was because he would um, never stick to a decision that the team made. So he'd be part of that decision-making group. He would put his ideas and thoughts in, but he wouldn't stick to those decisions. So I asked the team to do two things for me. One was let him ask his questions. Don't shut him down, just let him finish asking his questions. And the other was, if you make a decision in a meeting, please just send out a quick email afterwards with a sentence about what you agreed. And what they found was he stuck to each and every decision. And that about a third of the time, he found fundamental issues in how they were thinking of doing something by being allowed to ask his questions. He thought differently than they thought, and he wasn't into cycling, but he was somebody who thought differently. He brought neurodiversity to that group and to that team. And whilst I won't pretend that they were best of friends afterwards, the people in that team understood and appreciated what he brought. Now, um, my husband is uh, on the autistic spectrum. He's, he's uh, and I know, and the reason I asked them to write those things down is because my husband, who is a developer, he, it's not real for him if it's not written down. He could agree to anything, but if it's just verbal, it doesn't feel very real, uh, which means that we have all sorts of interesting conversations. Um, we've had to come up with something where we say, um, if I say, is that a commitment? He understands that that's the equivalent of, would you write this down? <laughs> and, and we've come to agreements on that. So that experience and that knowledge of people who are different allowed us to deal with these people differently. There's always people... There are people who are excluded from things, people who don't work the same way that I work, people who don't think the same way that I think. They are the people who are bringing value to your team. So that's the odd man out. We then get the who's to blame question. One organisation I joined had, um, had had a CIO years before. His name was Jeff. I shouldn't know that, but I know that because they still talked about Jeff a lot. If there was a problem in a production environment and customers were impacted, Jeff would stand behind the person who was trying to sort this out and shout at them until it was fixed. Um, this was very helpful behaviour, as I'm sure you're aware, helped them to focus on sorting these issues out. Um, but that blame culture that came from that, that lack of willingness to fail, was endemic 
uh, about four years later when I joined the organisation, four years after he had left. Um, plenty of conversation about failure. I found I had to talk about my failures all the time at that organisation to set up experiments and talk about the fact that they may well fail. And it was very shocking to people. Uh, there was a lot of self-punishment went on at that organisation. Someone who did something that affected something in production, who then just wrote themselves a big note and stuck it on their monitor that said, do not test in production. They didn't even know they were in production when they made that mistake. And that note doesn't help anybody because it wasn't a deliberate thing that happened. I suggest and encourage everybody here to talk about your failures all the time because actually those are the things that people learn from. Okay. So, very early in my career, when I was the very first time actually that I was asked to technically lead a piece of work. And it was in my team that I'd worked in quite successfully for a while, small team, around four of us. It was a long time ago. There weren't these separated roles at the time, so we were all developers, we were all testers, we were all BAs, we all did all of the work. And we'd worked together for a long time, really worked together positively. I was asked to lead a, a piece of work and this was the first time for me, so I was leading it. Um, and one of the guys on the team started behaving strangely. So he wouldn't write the code, just didn't deliver anything. Um, when I badgered him to actually do the work, he would do it, but it would be really low quality. Now, I knew this developer. I knew that he was capable of writing really good quality code. And I kind of, I had to almost sit over him and make him write the code right. And I spent about six months wondering what on earth was wrong with him until I realized that the question I should have been asking was, what on earth is wrong with me? And I think the mistake that I'd made is the assumption that he was motivated by the things that motivated me. As a developer, I loved writing framework type code. Bear in mind, this was a long time ago, so a long time. It, open source existed, but most organizations refused to use it. That's how long ago this was. So you needed to write yourself framework code. You needed to do that, or you were just writing things all the time that were doing similar things to what you'd done before. So we were developing framework type code as well as implementing things that needed to be done. That I really enjoyed, just having to config the new requirement that came in. That was a real buzz for me high quality, knowing that what I delivered had no issues in it, a huge buzz for me. And this was the first time in my career that I realized other people were motivated by different things that motivated me. So after about six months, I happened to ask him to write a, a small utility for us. Um, we had, this was really long ago, so uh, there were no free bug tracking software, no cheap bug tracking software at the time. And we just needed something that would generate us a unique number. There are various reasons why we need something to generate it. I won't go into that. We just needed a quick utility that we could run on the command line that would just give us a unique number for our bug tracking. And if I'd written that, I'd have just written something that just did the job. He did it and he created Mabel. So when you actually wanted a number, you went and typed this thing in, and up came a picture of an old lady called Mabel. And she would ask you something. And you had to be ultra polite to Mabel. If you put any swear words in or were slightly curt, she just wouldn't talk to you for at least five more tries. Um, she, um, you know, she insisted on utter best manners, so you had to address her properly, be nice. Um, and if you were nice enough, she would give you a number. And Mabel became an extra member of our team, really changed the culture of our team. When we were designing, we'd ask the question, what would Mabel do here? Um, he added so much to our team and to our culture and to who we were that I never would have added 
and he loved doing it, and he um, thoroughly enjoyed those types of things and added so much more. So from that point on, I gave him all of those types of things that there were to do. And he enjoyed those, and though he enjoyed those enough that he also did the other work and developed that and did that well. And it was a really good lesson for me in actually motivation, the fact that not everybody is like me, not everybody wants what I want. And that diversity of approach and that diversity of motiv motivation also being super important. I'm sure most people in the room have heard this. Um, this is something particularly I hear when I'm doing agile transformations in organisations. And um, normally from the last people you would expect to hear these things from. So the people who are really into it, really good, really doing... And then you just hear, I've done my bit. To which my response is, why is it live then? because that's, that's the only way you can have done your bit. Um, there was a discussion in one of the sessions yesterday about I've done my bit being about communication. I actually don't think it is. When I hear the I've done my bit, it's not about the fact they don't know what the whole picture is. It's about the fact they honestly believe their job is only this much. And maybe it's because I come from a time when there were no differentiated jobs. When I started, every developer was a full stack developer. It wasn't a choice. Every developer was a tester. I'm not saying that was necessarily good because we weren't trained to test properly. Um, and every developer was a BA and every developer did every role. Um, so maybe it's partly from that time, but it's not done until you've added value. If it's not live, you haven't added value. Ergo, you have not done your bit. Angry Man. So uh, you heard in the introduction that Angry Man was a discussion I had uh, a few years ago when I was last at the conference here. But um, I want to talk about Angry Man because this was a really important part of my career and my growth as a person. I joined an organisation and within the first week at that organisation, um, I was in a meeting. There were about 10 of us in the meeting. One of the people there had asked me something earlier in the week about something that he needed my team to solve for him, a problem he had. And we'd had discussions. And this meeting was for us to talk about that problem and how we were thinking of solving it. So I started to talk to him about how we were thinking of solving it. And he got really angry. Um, his voice was shaking, he was controlling it, he was visibly shaking himself, he got to that point. Obviously incredibly angry. I didn't know why, I couldn't tell why. He was um, keeping control of it, but it was actually still quite intimidating. I'm sitting there with a group of people who I don't know. I'm new to this organisation. I have members of my team who report in to me there, but I don't know them. I have uh, his boss there, but his boss started one week before I did, so he was about a week and a half into his position. Um, and I'm just sat there. No one else is saying anything. So I don't know if this is normal at that organisation. Um, and at some point, I just carried on because I didn't know how to deal with it. So I just carried on as if he wasn't angry. Um, and at some point, he just got up and said, I've got to go and left the room. And I looked around at everybody else who was in that room and just said, what was that about? And everyone just went, I have no idea. And we all left the room, and I was trying to mull about what I could do about this. What was the right thing to do? I'm not very easily intimidated. I'm quite internally referenced. And what I mean by that is, um, if someone said to you, how do you know if you, you know, um, did you do a good job yesterday? Um, and you answer, you know, yes, no, whatever. How do you know if you did a good job yesterday? And if the answer is, 
well, uh, I got feedback from my boss, from my colleagues, from whatever. They told me I did a good job yesterday. Then that's externally referenced. If the answer is, I just know I did a good job yesterday, or I just know I didn't do a good job yesterday, that's internally referenced. And people who are internally referenced tend to care far less about what other people think of them, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, it means that I don't really care if you enjoy this talk. That's not true. Um, <laughs> but it also means that, uh, let's say there's an area I could really improve on, and you came and you let me know that, I'm probably less likely to receive that information. I will do that, but it will probably take me a little while to do that than somebody who's externally referenced. So neither's good or bad, it's just different. Because I'm quite internally referenced, the fact that this guy was angry with me doesn't affect me. I mean, it does, but to a much lesser extent. But I was kind of annoyed. If I had been quite externally referenced, this is my first week in the job. It's actually quite unacceptable behavior even if it wasn't my first week in the job. Um, overly aggressive, unnecessary. Um, so part of me wanted vengeance on him. Part of me wanted to go and report that he'd behaved this way, take it up higher, go and talk to his boss who'd been in the room about the fact this behavior was unacceptable. What I actually did was sit back and say, what do I want out of this? What is the outcome that I want to achieve? And the answer was, I just need a good working relationship with this guy. I just need to be able to work with him. Um, so I waited a few hours for him to calm down a bit, maybe. I didn't know why he had been so angry. There was nothing in that session that should have made him angry. And my best guess was that perhaps something else at work was going badly, perhaps something was going badly at home, perhaps this wasn't really about me. Um, so one of my other thoughts was that I would go to him and say, and ask him why he behaved that way, and, um, and make him tell me. But if the fact that, if it wasn't me, then that's again just an aggressive thing that uh, is trying to punish him for his behavior. So what I actually did was go up to him and say, I have no idea what I did that upset you earlier, but whatever it was, I'm really sorry. And he said, thank you. And he smiled, and that was the end of it. Which is great, because I got my good working relationship with him, but it's also really bad, because I still, to this day, have no idea what I did that really upset him. So it's really unsatisfying. Um, but that stepping back and asking myself, what do I want out of this? I don't see enough of that in organizations. I don't see enough. Whenever I see upset between people, there's normally a lack of respect there from one side or the other. And I hear the phrase at work sometimes when I'm talking to people about this, they don't deserve respect. If we start from a place where people don't deserve respect or a place where they haven't yet earned respect, there's one thing that's utterly sure, and that's that you are going to have problems between people if that's the attitude um, and if that's ordinary within the organisation. So I worked with uh, the chief operating officer of one of my organisations, and she was uh, command and control through and through. Uh, financial organization, 140 years old, very hierarchical. She had worked at the organization for most of her career, worked her way up and through, so she knew how that organization worked, and she knew that management style. She invited me um, to run a piece of work with her because she'd seen that I'd run lean pieces of work with the business elsewhere and that it had been really successful. So she sat me down and she said, OK, so this is the problem. These are the people who are going to work on the problem. These are the work streams that we're going to have. These are the outputs that need to be delivered. And these are the people who are going to work on each one of those work streams. And... I said, well, we could run it that way, 
and it would work. Or we could run it this way, where we invite those people you've suggested, but also we invite other people who have transferable skills who are not directly in that area. We uh, have a kickoff session where we listen to everybody and the problems they see with the current approach and the current process. And we uh, understand from them and everyone gets a common understanding of the issues across the piece. And we could invite them to come up with what the areas are that need working on and them to self-select which areas they want to work on. And she kind of looked very uncomfortable and just said to me, oh, OK, um, which would you do? And I'm like, well, I'd do the one that I suggested, you know, and this is how we run the other things. And so she did that. And actually, I've got huge respect for her. She sat through that kickoff session with her hands clenched under the table because she was so stressed by it. And um, But at the end of that, she stood up in front of an internal operations conference and talked about how much more she got out of that than she ever expected. She went back to her list of all of the things that she had um, she had said she wanted at the start. And not only were they delivered, but much above and beyond. Bear in mind, this was not an empowered organisation. So we took this group of people and empowered them for the first time in their working careers at that organisation. And so they did so much more than she ever imagined that they could have done because they had all of these great ideas already. It's just no one had been listening to them for a long time. So that was great and she saw that it worked really well. What she didn't get was why it worked really well. She believed it was the process that we'd done, how often we had meetings, um, how we communicated out, um, the way in which that first session was run. She believed it was the process which had succeeded, not the empowerment, which actually is at the core of why all of these things succeed. Um, and so she then attempted to codify this and make it a thing that people did. And I, I trained a couple of project managers to do this thing. And, um, and, and I see the process conversation now in Agile generally. I mean, when I first started in Agile in um, 2000, early 2000s, it was expected that you changed the, pr the process. That's a standard part of the process. At your retrospective, you say, is this working for me? And if it isn't, if this is not working well, we change it. And that includes the process. More and more now, I hear, that's the process. I actually heard that said at one organisation I was at, um, where I was attending one of the retrospectives. And every retrospective I ever attended at that organisation, they had a whole day of meetings in between, uh, in between their sprints. And they had their retrospective, they had their planning, they had their demo, all on one day. And they were two week sprints. So it's actually quite a big, uh, big investment of time. And at every retrospective that I was ever invited to go and attend, people said, we spend too much time in meetings. And at every one of those retrospectives, they were told, that's the process. If I ever hear that's the process within an agile type approach and organisation, then I know that is broken. It is not the process. The process is adaption and doing what's right and what works for the team. The question is, what would you do if you were not doing that? What? OK, so let's say the problem is we're spending too much time in meetings. OK, here are the things we're trying to achieve in the meetings. How can we achieve those if we're not doing these meetings? Could we do quicker meetings? Let's actually have that discussion. And talking about people, I had... Uh, one particular session where I had <laughs> I, I run a local meetup group in, in the town where I live for Agile. And we had somebody at that session who was talking about the daily stand-up and how you can improve it and how to make it fun and all of those sorts of things. And at the end I asked him a question around if you've got a an 
immature team, very new to Agile, then I would always say, daily stand-up, you must have a daily stand-up. Here's what you're going to get out of it. This is why. Let's do it. Because people tend to uh, not want to do their daily stand-ups. But to a really mature team, I would ask the question, do you need your daily stand-up? If you're all co-located, if you're all communicating well, do you still need it? Is it adding value? So I asked the person who'd done the talk what his thoughts were on that. And I had someone else stand up at the back of the room and point at me and say, you can't do that, that's not Scrum. Um, and um, I was quite taken aback by this. Um, and it's like, you can't call it Scrum if you're not having a daily stand-up. Well, for one, you can, because you can call anything anything you want. And for two, actually... If it's not working for you and you don't need it, a key part of Scrum is to alter the process. You alter the process in the retrospective. And if that daily stand-up is not adding value, then you should do that. If it is, it's a useful conversation to be having anyway. Um, but yes, it's really interesting to me how fundamental people have become about their particular process. It's people and interactions over processes and tools. And that applies to Agile processes too. This is not um, something that you can't do and through. And just because it's not in the Scrum documentation doesn't mean you can't do it, even if you are doing Scrum. I have nothing against Scrum, by the way. I'm, personally, I prefer Kanban, but um, I have nothing against Scrum. But it has become, because it is the system that's used by so many people nowadays, and it's become codified, lots of organisations have brought it in and said, right, we have a process, and this is the process, and you must follow it. Um, you are losing a lot of the value of Agile, a lot of the value of choosing the approach that suits that team, that works for that type of work, for those people who are on the team, and all of the extra value that gets added through doing that. So the moral of these stories are not surprising. They're all about respecting each other, respecting everybody. Everyone is great at something. It may not be the same thing that you're great at. So what is it they're great at? You know, Find that out, spend that time, build those relationships, work with those people as if they are deserving of respect. Because if you do, they will work with you. Empowerment, it's not the process, it's letting people make the difference that they can make. It's allowing them to come to work and add extra value than you're asking them to add. It's diversity, diversity of thinking, neurodiversity, diversity in every single possible way. Truly people who use our products, the different types of people, different types of people creating those products in the first place. And those shared goals of the team, knowing where you're going. So I would like to thank you for listening to my therapy session. And uh, don't charge me afterwards because I can't afford it. But I really appreciate you all. Thank you. <laughs>